All righty. <clears throat> so um, we're talking about Google Zinc, uh, which is a, a sort of an integrated software platform for 3D rendering, and it works with Max, uh, with Maya, with Cinema 4D. And I ran into it about a year and a half ago. Um, it's been, been around for a couple years, uh, but about a year and a half ago, I uh, first started dabbling in it, and it has changed my workflow entirely. And uh, so I'm going to share with you the kind of cha the changes that it brought in um, how I operate, and hopefully it'll have some sort of application for, for the 3D animators out here, uh, how you guys operate as well. So before I can get started on that, uh, just to make sure I don't lose anybody, uh, I'm going to talk just briefly about how 3D rendering works um, and um, how, how it's work it works over multiple machines. So basically, in the 3D programs, you've got like a virtual camera and a virtual set and things happening and so forth that you set up. And the virtual camera takes, uh, you, you tell the virtual camera to take individual photographs, virtual photographs, to, uh, to become footage, just like a real camera. And uh, it's all based on the kind of materials you put on your objects and the textures and the lighting and whether light's going to bounce around in there and, and so forth. And different things that you do, different settings that you set in your 3D file are going to make it take longer or shorter to render. Uh, that render happens either in the CPU, the, the, the processor, the uh, central processor of your computer, or it happens in the GPU, the graphics card, uh, depending on which uh, 3D rendering software you're using. Um, unless you're using something like Redshift or, uh, or Octane, if you're just using the vanilla rendering package that comes with your 3D software, it's probably the CPU. Um, now, sometimes it takes a long time to render. This is this took a huge amount of time to render because there's like a volumetric field behind, with a light with a volumetric field behind these big gelatinous orbs with um, blurry transparency, which if you're an animator, you're probably like, oh God. Um, but yeah, so it took forever to render these frames. And um, this is done in Arnold, by the way, which is on its own incredibly uh, processor intensive. Like it just uses so much, it takes so much power to use. Um, so it's not really accessible for somebody working on one machine. Um, so a lot of times, uh, studios will have a render farm. Usually, up, to, up until like now, basically, um, your studio would have a whole bunch of computers uh, in a basement somewhere, um, probably with its own dedicated uh, air conditioner. Um, and they, you'd send all of your frames there, and you'd have to, you, the, those computers would do all the rendering while you did all the work. And that way you could, multi you could do your rendering in parallel. And that's the whole point. So, oh, I just talked about, yeah, so that's what a farm is. Um, so here's the first farm, like, dedicated farm machine that Microverse Studios um, built in-house. And I think Kelvin was there for it. But uh, basically, uh, I bought some um, computer parts, and I put them together, and whenever it was time to render something, I'd take my car keys and I'd like short out the, I found out where the on jumper is for it and I'd like short it out. Eventually I destroyed it with static electricity, so don't do that, don't learn from that. Um, but uh, it was a good and cheap solution. At the time it had four cores, not that you'd need that much processing power, but that's how much it had, I was very proud of that. And eventually, once this proof of concept worked, I then combined IKEA furniture with you know, my Newegg account and built 20 machines that sat in IKEA, these IKEA shelves. Um, and that was our render farm for a long time. And Ikumi, you were there too. So yeah, we, we had a whole bunch of, a bank of switches on the wall that you'd like turn them all on in order to power on all these machines. Uh, and it was great. And it was extremely powerful compared to what we were all used to, what I was used to for sure at the time. Uh, which was rendering on either my machine or waiting until everybody went home for the night and then rendering on all of our office machines. Um, but with all of these, um, with all local farms, you kind of run into a, a few very specific um, issues that are going to be the same in all, um, in all farm situa uh, scenarios. The first is that you have a, an upper limit on the performance. When we had 20 computers uh, on our farm, that meant that those 20 computers 
if we had one minute frames, if each frame was one minute on a computer, we could do 20 minutes worth of rendering in one minute, and that was great. But that was the upper limit. And if we had more to do than that, than that, like it would just take more time. So that still meant that we had overnight renders and occasionally multi-day multi renders. And those can be problematic when you're running into deadlines or when you forget to check a checkbox or something like that and you waste a ton of time. Um, the second is, of course, the upfront cost. Each of those machines cost 600 bucks, and that was 20 of them, so it, you know, it starts to become like, it starts to, the, the cost starts to pile up a little bit. Um, and of course, you're, if you're a small studio, if you're um, you know, a, a, an independent studio, if it's just you, then that kind of, dropping that kind of cash up front to get these capabilities can be really painful, and it's not always uh, practical. And of course, there's always the potential for IT issues. If you're working on home-built systems, um, chances are you're going to have like one computer that just refuses to interact with the other ones, that just won't get onto the farm. Or you, and every time, every time you update the render node software, there's going to be new issues. It just, they always pop up, and then you're wasting your time trying to take care of that. Or you're paying somebody else to do that. Like, or you have an IT guy that you have um, solve all these problems for you, but that's still money, money and time. And then, of course, guaranteed obsolescence is just part of the sad fact of, of life. We all grow old and die, and computers do it way faster than people. So um, when you have a computer on the farm, those four, render core, those four core machines um, eventually were the slowest thing on my farm, and I, by turning them on, that one frame that they were doing would take longer than the 10 frames that all the com other computers were doing. So I had to wait for them to finish before, um, well, anyway, the short, uh, long story short, they slowed, the com they slowed the farm down by them just being there. So eventually I just donated them. So that was when I started dabbling with um, Amazon's AWS. This is about 2012 now. Um, I had virtualized the office. Everybody worked from home. And we still had a render farm that we would dial into uh, using VPN, but um, there was one point where I moved to Jacksonville, Florida. Wonderful place. Um, but I moved to Jacksonville, Florida, and the whole render farm got put into a moving van, and that, you know, obviously made it really hard to render with. So I set up a, um, I had exper experimented beforehand by setting up a, instance, like a virtual machine on Amazon's um, Amazon Web Services. They, they let you basically conjure up a virtual machine that you can install whatever software you want on and uh, operate via VPN. So I installed a, a render server there, and I created an instance that was a render node that looked at that render server, and I made like a hundred of those. And that was my first, like, taste of power. <laughs> so, but... Uh, well, anyway, so, so I did that, and I was able to power drive through some very tight deadlines during that move, which was insane. Um, and, but the, th the problem with the Amazon Web Services doing it that way, where you are managing all these little machines, is that you start paying for those machines the second you turn them on until the second you turn them off. And it doesn't tell you when you're done rendering, or like even how far along you are. So you have to babysit it. And you don't know which of those render nodes is finished rendering them. Uh, some of them will be uh, still rendering while others are off. So you have to keep them all on until the last one is done. And then if you like forget, and or or, or you just uh, don't, you forget to turn them off or something like that. I mean, that's a hundred machines at a dollar fifty an hour, right? So it's not that bad, but you know, it's a hundred fifty dollars an hour. And you don't know how long it's going to take, and what if it takes eight hours, and then all of a sudden you've spent a whole bunch of money. And so, like, you just really have to take a lot of attention, put a lot of attention into it, and it's not really practical. Um, but it was necessary at the time, and it was very helpful. Um, but then I unpacked my render farm, put them all into my home office, got another, or put my extra air conditioner in there, and used that for a long time. Um, but then I found out about Google's Inc., so here's what my, my interface looks like, um, and everything looks super tiny because this is roughly the actual size of my monitor that I use at home. So I've zoomed in here on the Google Zinc um, dialog. 
So you'll see here a bunch of little things. Basically, Google Zinc is integrated into Cinema 4D. I don't know if it is for Max and Maya, um, but I know that it supports them. Um, but in, in Cinema 4D, it's basically just a drop down. Um, and you're, what you do, you, you set your take, you set your, you, well, it draws all of this information from your, from your file. But uh, you can double check before you send everything out your, uh, which take you're going to render. And if you're, you're working in Cinema 4D, you should know what takes are. Um, your output paths, how many frames or what frames you're going to do, whether you're going to do all the frames or, or, and so forth. Your little chunk size down there in the corner. Do we have a laser pointer? Oh, man. I really want to point. But anyway, down at the bottom, you've got your chunk size, which is how many frames each individual um, virtual computer is going to render. And then the best part is over here. This is like my favorite moment whenever I'm working because right here, this guy, the financial tool is makes 96 virtual CPUs, 192 gigabytes. This is like one and a half times as powerful as my home working machine, my workstation. And it's $1.30 an hour. It's so cheap. And up at the top there, you can type in how many you want. And it just magically like conjures up for me 200. And so all of a sudden, that makes it so that uh, software like Arnold that was previously just inaccessible from a processing standpoint, now I can do whatever I want. You know, I don't have to worry. I don't have to, like, come up with um, kludgy hacks for showing things, uh, for simulating a subsurface scattering just so I can have it render fast. I don't have to do After Effects um, uh, workarounds to, make, to simulate uh, blurry transparency or um, volumetric effects. I just build it. And in Arnold, it's so easy. It's like the easiest rendering. It's easier, it's actually easier to use than Cinema 4D's native rendering, like standard renderer. It's so easy. Um, but, uh, the, and it looks great, just out of the box. But it's render intensive. And so with this, now I can do whatever I want. The lid is totally blown off of uh, capabilities. So right here, what you're looking at is the, uh, just for the standard render. And I, I did a screen grab for a couple of different renders. This is for Arnold. You'll notice that that preemptible instance down at the bottom is now $1.76. And I'll talk about what preemptible means in a second. Um, but going back here, this is the standard one. It's $1.31. There it's $1.76. And that's because, even better, the licensing for the render nodes, or for the, yeah, for the render node um, render node licensing for the rendering software is built into the licensing for Google Zinc, which means that you don't have to buy a whole bunch of extra note like render licenses, um, which is another uh, issue if you're trying to build your own local render farm. Um, and so it's $1.76 for, uh, per hour for these super powerful computers to work with Arnold. And then with Redshift, for those of you working in Redshift, um, it's $13 an hour for a preemptible one, but you'll notice it's got eight Tesla GPUs, which, mind-blowing. Anyway, so, and I'm just going to take a, just a minute or two to, to, to show you a couple of the features of the web interface. I know it's starting to get a little bit boring because it's just text. I'll get some pictures later. Uh, but um, this, you, it gives you a, a readout of all of the projects that you've got. Um, right now, none of these are in progress right now. You can see in the status column, they're all done. Um, but you can see off to the right, the runtime, how long each of these took. So you see how long uh, these renders that would normally take hours, are, or like even overnight, are taking 20, 30, 40 minutes. And down there I've got a 20-hour one. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, and then you can get, easily get a breakdown, a uh, graphical breakdown of, and a report of your renders by machine, by software, and by project. Machine type, software, and project. Um, and you can't see it here. I, you know, you kind of can, um, where I made a little mistake. That blue bar should never be there. That, that blue bar up at the top, that is, um, I'm going to talk about preemptible versus non-preemptible instances. So really quick, I'm going to go back here. All right. Notice, at the top of that, um, at the top of that list, there's uh, eight virtual zinc, eight virtual CPUs, 16 gigabytes of RAM. Um, for a dollar twenty-six, that's pretty much the same cost as um, as the most powerful version, almost. But why is it so cheap, or why is it so expensive? It's because when you're getting these instances, you're renting computer time from Google, and Google uh, will give you those computers and 
make sure that they're completely yours and that nothing can happen to them. They will run until your project is done if, you, if that's what you want. It's going to cost a pretty penny. But if you're willing to let Google take away your computer uh, processing time and give it to a bank who's trying to um, uh, fight a denial of service attack, then they'll charge you less for it. Now, of course, that in my experience in the last year and a half, that has never happened. I've never like lost a project because it, it got preempted. And I think that if it did, like I'd start buying canned food because something terrible is happening. But the, the preemptible, you always want to use preemptible because it's so much cheaper and it'll actually restart the, the, um, the job once the uh, preemption is over. So um, that blue bar up there is when I spend $1,000 using the wrong um, instance type. So uh, basically what ultimately all this means is that now I'm regularly using uh, Arnold to make 20 minute frames, a frame that takes 20 minutes to render and you know the average animation is going to be like 5,000, 6,000 frames and at home I now have, like I've chucked my old render farm, I still have a few of my most powerful machines which are basically clones of my workstation and I keep them around just in case my workstation craps out on me. So, but I never turn them on. And um, so it would take my local farm, it would take weeks to execute the, the kind of work that I'm doing now. But now it's just like a half an hour. So um, I'll just quickly touch on these uh, benefits. Um, so you can have it as fast as you want with no cost difference. The, I haven't quite specified what that means yet. So if it's going to take a hundred hours on one of those super powerful machines. You're going to pay for that hundred hours no matter what. So why not have a hundred of those machines working at the same time, you get it faster and it costs the same. So that's the, the sudden like flexibility to make it all happen at once means that you can have rapid turnaround on stuff that you couldn't before. And of course as a general rule you want to make sure that you're um, that you're, you test render. I always test render. Make a, I make a low fidelity render, uh, or not fidelity, sorry, low sample render to make sure that it looks right, to make sure that everything's moving right before I drop the big bucks. But um, even, even so, the big bucks are only a, like 5% of, even with that thousand dollar overage on that one, it was like 5% of the project cost. It's based, as Andrew Swift said, it's basically free. So, um, you can track cost and efficiency and that, that could be helpful in a small studio environment or in a studio environment where you want to make sure that everybody's making proper use of resources and time. Um, so, uh, and per project, if you wanted to, if rendering was something that you included as a line item, um, that, you know, it gives you the uh, capability of, of, um, of tracking that kind of data. And also, I find that it gives me less guff than using the actual team render within, within Cinema 4D. Team render, for some, like, every time I use team render, like, it starts addending little, like, um, iteration numbers to my renders. For, for what I, I can't even tell what the reason is, but by the end, like, all of my stuff is named wrong, and it just bothers me. Um, and then, this last one is something that I haven't taken advantage of yet, but I have this fantasy of like renting a house for three months somewhere and bringing my workstation with me and doing my work there and just, if I have the internet, I mean if I have like decent internet that can help me to upload and download the, the files, there's no reason why I can't do that. There's no reason why we can't work off of our, I mean if you can work through a laptop, which I can't, it's like trying to do work through a porthole, but um, if you can work off of a laptop, uh, then you can do this in a coffee shop. You can send stuff to render from wherever. Not only that, but that web interface, I use that on my phone to check to see how my renders are going while I'm eating lunch or whatever. You know, like it's, you don't have to use it on your machine. You can just update stuff, uh, check your, your uh, render status from anywhere. On top of that, if you feel like it's not going fast enough, you can go into the render interface and allocate more machines for it. So, you can even change the, um, the execution of the project on the fly. So, um, yeah, and that last little thing, uh, there was a time when, I don't know if you guys remember Hurricane Irene, it was pretty crazy, and for some reason, Maryland gets more hurricanes than Florida. I don't know what the geometry, it has something to do with the geometry of the, of the continent, 
but Hurricane Irene smashed into Maryland and knocked a tree like through my house. And so we had to live in a hotel for a month. And um, that gave me a lot of Marriott points, but it <laughs> was a pretty big like bite in my workflow. Luckily, I had an office, and the office was intact. But um, in that kind of state of emergency, right? If that happened now, if I brought, if, if like a tree went through my house now, I could immediately set up shop with no break in workflow because my render farm, um, if my render farm goes down, it's because, you know, it's Mad Max time. So uh, potential pitfalls for Google Zinc, there are very few, but they do exist. Um, the, uh, of course, you need the internet. Um, and chances are we're working, uh, like I, I've met like one client in the last 10 years, like actually face-to-face -face spoken with one client uh, in the last 10 years. The rest of them, they don't have any idea what I look like um, or whether I'm wearing clothes. <laughs> um, so the, uh, uh, the so, well, just to go back, um, the point being that you probably already have internet. You do need good internet, especially if you're doing a lot of caching, right? So if you're doing like X particles, I'm sorry, I don't mean to get too much in the weeds here, but uh, if you're using X particles, Zinc doesn't have X, X particles installed on their machines, and besides, you'd have to cache it anyway. So there's like a workflow that you have to take those X particles, bring them through thinking particles in the MoGraph, and then apply your, your instances there. And there's a, I can send you a tutorial that I put together for how to do that. I can also send you a tutorial for how to use um, uh, Google Zinc as well. Just let me know, and I'll, I'll send it to you. Or I think, I think if you just look it up on Vimeo, it should be on there, like the Microverse Vimeo channel. Um, but yeah, so software version lag. Um, with version 20, uh, R20 for Cinema 4D, it took like six months before they had that up and running for uh, Google Zinc. And it was because it was a major architecture change. So I had to work in 19 while all of my friends were using volumes and stuff like that, and it was really annoying. And, but uh, R21, um, the lag was only about probably a month and a half. Uh, so uh, because it wasn't a big architecture change. But there, you're always going to be using a slightly less new version of the software. Um, so when really juicy new effects come out, you, you're not, you're not going to be able to use them right away. So that's, that's the one like, you know, the one sort of needling uh, issue with it. And also, of course, mistakes cost money. Um, chances are you'll make one or two big, big mistakes in the beginning, and then that'll hurt so bad that you'll never make those mistakes again. But uh, Google Zinc also doesn't, it only gives you 50 uh, potential instances, or 16, I think it's 16 or 20, some, some small number of potential GPUs um, that you can use. You have to specifically contact them and ask for more. And we did that. I was like, why, why do we only have uh, 50 computers? I want 100, 100 computers. And they're like, okay, here's 100 computers. And then later on I was like, hey guys, can I have 200 computers? And they're like, sure, here's 200 computers. But I think the reason is that they want to make sure that you don't go and um, cost yourself 2,000 bucks and then like they lose you as a client. So you want to kind of ease your way into it while you get to know it. At least that's what they want. And otherwise, it's just standard farm concerns. Like you, you've got to cache all of your floating point um, operations. You've got to make sure that your, um, that your noise patterns are, well, basically cache all your floating point operations. And if you don't know what that means, you will. So here is, um, here's a cartoon for all of you. This is basically my, uh, the, the most recent project that we've completed for using Arnold. And this one was the one with the 20 minute frames. It was insane to produce. Um, and we only had one month. I had one month to get all this done. It was like, this is a minute and a half, I think. Um, but the whole, the overall production was like six minutes. We had one month to get all this done and it was 20 minute frames and stuff, but Google Zinc made it so that I'd build, I'd like the, the renders were done before I even had the next sequence ready to render. So um, that's what made it possible.
Yeah, so Google Zinc is dope. <laughs> That's my talk. Thank you.